Uh, so before I turn the microphone over to the speaker, I'd also like to say a few in words of introduction about him. I just had the honor and pleasure of meeting him uh, right before we started, and that is Dr. T.H.B. Simons, the founding president and ven venier professor emeritus at Trent University. He's closely associated with the development of Canadian studies. He is best known as chair of the influential 1972 Commission on Canadian Studies and author of To Know Ourselves, the report of the Commission on Canadian Studies, which affirmed archives significant role in Canada's collective memory. He wrote, quote, Canadian archives are the foundation of Canadian studies and the development of Canadian studies will depend in large measure upon the satisfactory development of Canadian archival resources, end quote. He is the honorary chair of today's Canadian Archives Summit. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. Simons to the podium. Yes. And he is going to stay where he is, I think. And I think that microphone is working. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Alford, for your very kind words. Coming from a person with such a long and distinguished experience in the world of university, library, and public affairs, they're greatly appreciated. Uh, as head librarian of this university, you follow in the footsteps of some very great predecessors, as I'm sure you know. And I hope it's not invidious to mention one of them, Dr. W. Stuart Wallace, the head librarian for 31 years, who was an important part of my education and university experience when I was an undergraduate at this university. As uh, you will know, uh, Dr. Wallace was himself an historian, a writer, a scholar, a bibliophile, and a teacher in the broadest sense. He took a kindly and thoughtful interest in students, often discussing and advising us on books and archives and materials for our research. He wrote the high school text for Canadian history, which was long used throughout the province. And he had a little gimmick. He used to head every chapter in anything he wrote, and particularly for these schools, with a an archival quotation, an extract from an archival document. And he was in this way engaging in the educational process of the importance and the utility of archives. It was a neat gimmick and one that I'm very grateful for. And when subjects come up, I find my mind, which is such as it is, flicking backwards and remembering the quote that Dr. W. Stuart Wallace used to explain the plains of Abraham or uh, uh, Jacques Cartier or what have you. It's extraordinary the good influence this kindly gentleman had. His successor, Robert Blackburn, was also a very helpful mentor to many students. But I have to caution you, Larry, that he also was head librarian for 30 years. <laughs> so brace yourself. Um, you have, uh, Mr. Alfred, undertaken a great responsibility in leading the libraries of this university. Uh, and it's wonderful that you're there, and I know you'll do it with immense distinction. I can't be in this building without saying just a word about it. For me, it's a kind of archival document in the extended sense of archives, including memorabilia. And Devonshire House is one of the chief pieces of memorabilia in my life. I lived here in this building for eight years when I was dean of, the, dean of men for the professional faculties at this university before I went to help start Trent. And I must say I loved every day of it. Uh, they were very tolerant of me. I was a mere arts graduate, and many of them were old, older than I was at the time, uh, but they were very kindly. And so were the alumni. There was a person who came one day, he had graduated, oh, 30 years before, and had his life in British Columbia, and he had not been back to the university in those 30 years, and he wanted to come and see where he had lived here in Devonshire House. There were 200 students living here. Uh, and we had a nice chat, and I gave him a cup of tea and so on. And then he said, could he see room 217? That, that happened 
quite often alumni would come back and want to see where they had hung out. Um, and I said, sure, and we went along. And to my astonishment, he pulled out a screwdriver, proceeded to unscrew a floorboard in the cupboard, and brought out a bottle of rye. <laughs> and he said, I've been thinking about that for 30 years. <laughs> Uh, that, too, is archival, I think. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, messieurs, mesdames, uh, I'm really honored and touched to be invited to serve as your honorary chair and to say a few words. They will be few, I assure you, as at the age of 85, uh, I do not have a superfluity of original thoughts, and I have to ration them. So I, I will speak with care. But echoing uh, Larry, may I begin by congratulating those who undertook the planning and the arrangements for this conference. It's a most significant and unusual conference. It is an enormous undertaking and one that will make uh, most important and timely contributions to the archives of Canada and to the vital services they provide. Many have been involved, but if you will allow me, I want to join Larry in acknowledging in particular the inspiration and leadership of my good friend Ian Wilson. He is the founder of this feast, and we are all indebted to you. Thank you. I do have uh, just a few brief comments, broad comments, concerns, if you like, to share with you on the subject of archives. But first, I must make a confession. That is that I have absolutely no formal or professional or special qualifications to speak on the subject of archives. I have never taken even a course on archives, let alone a degree or a diploma in the field. And I do not know a digitization from an enzyme. My only possible excuse for accepting the invitation to participate today is my profound interest in archives and my profound indebtedness to them and to the members of the profession. I am simply a user, an archives addict, who has become a tremendous appreciator of how greatly our national life has been enriched by archives and how much our national agenda depends upon them and upon always working from them upwards as we endeavor to move ahead as a society. Looking back over the years, I find that, to my astonishment, I've chaired or served upon an immense number of commissions, boards, committees of inquiry and such, a federal, provincial, local, international, some 50 of them. And the result is my good friends in the archives at Trent University must curse me daily uh, because each of these has a tale an archival tale, you know, another few meters of documents from this commission or that board. And uh, Janice Millard, who is in charge of the archives at Trent, is here today, and she can perhaps tell you how many preposterous cubic meters of archival material I've inflicted on her as a result of these various interests. Uh, of these undertakings, some of them being genuinely useful, others might possibly be described as a train wreck. But they all produced archives, and they all have tales to tell and uh, are perhaps of interest to researchers in the years to come. Perhaps on balance, I might be allowed to believe that this work, done with so many others, has been of some public value. The reason I tell you about this is because on reflection, I note that in every instance of these various undertakings, I found that the effective point of departure was always archival work. What were the origins and beginnings of the matter under study or proposed? What ground had been covered to date and what had been neglected? What were the findings to date and by whom? And how reliable were those findings? What aspects were still unresolved? What avenues should be explored? One worked forward from these fundamental archival facts 
to find a way, a point of departure for virtually every undertaking in the fields of scholarship and certainly for any activities in the area of public policy. From this you may conclude that I have not changed or wavered from the conclusion of the Commission on Canadian Studies to which Mr. Alford so graciously referred, that archives are the foundation for Canadian studies. Indeed, I have strengthened in this belief and enlarged it to one that sees archives through the information and materials they provide as the foundation for the advancement of knowledge on any subject. I'm profoundly indebted, as are all of us, to archives, to the archival profession, and to the archival approach. Nonetheless, I have just a few thematic concerns that I will share very briefly with you. First, I should note the dramatic and extensive progress there has been in the development of archives, in archival education, and in the creation of what might be called a Canadian archival system in the 40 or so years since I ventured to write on the subject and to know ourselves. Growth in the number and spread of opportunities for archival education is in fact quite extraordinary, but there is room and need for still further development in this field. Archival work has certainly found its place as a respected and important profession, but there is scope and need for further advancement in this field. Advancements in methodology, inventions, and technology increase dramatically the utility and the reach of archives, but they also pose problems and challenges in regard to stability, costs, and possible misuse. As populations grow, as history accumulates, as complexities of society increase, so does the sheer volume of archival materials, posing questions about the ordering, the volume, the classification, the storage, and the proper use of archives. And indeed, there is a large and growing challenge to be addressed about costs about how best to finance and to sustain this growing and unending but vital activity. There are also mounting ethical and political questions about the proper and improper use of archival information and about what controls and regulations should govern such matters and designed by whom and monitored by whom. And there is always, I think, the most basic question. It may be useful to take under consideration and to review at periodic intervals. That is, what are archives? What is the definition of archives? Is there, in fact, an agreed definition of what? Do we take a look at the Oxford Dictionary and then at Webster and one's on Saturn and the other's on Venus when they talk about archives. One says archives includes uh, paintings and memorabilia and sites, and the other says it's essentially the care and keeping of public documents. And these are substantially different views. Mm -hmm. uh, and they finding acceptable, workable definitions is more than a, a question of semantics. It's very important uh, in planning the education and the development of the profession, in allocating resources and time and budgets, to uh, know what the range is, what the agreed definition and scope of the activity is. I'm sure that uh, those deeply involved in the profession have a clear view of it. I hope that they may share it uh, a bit more with the interested members of the public. One area that, that interests me and perhaps has not received as much attention as it deserves is the um, 
What is the relationship between documentary archival resources and other artifactual heritage resources? Um, clearly, there are archival dimensions to artifacts, ranging from wampum and metals to Devonshire House. Uh, there's something there to be explored and defined and bridged. Uh, each uh, artifact, whether it's uh, something by print, has a story to tell. It's, it's a piece of heritage to read. A building, a site, medallions, wampum, they're all artifacts, but I believe they're archival too, in a sense. And it's disturbing to me that so much of the work being done uh, in a field which I'm spending much time on now, uh, the built heritage, the man-made heritage, the historic sites and monuments and buildings, um, probably is not adequately plugged in to the documentary heritage which can explain it and uh, inform people about it and be of so much help in providing guidance on how to treat and develop and respect the artifactual and the, the built heritage. I think there's scope and need for elements to uh, work more closely together. Um, There is some talk, there's some use of the term Canadian archival system. Uh, the term system in Canada covers a multitude of sins. Uh, you know, we have uh, what some people say is the loosest uh, federal system in the world, and others say it uh, is over systematized, and so on. But. I think it's necessary and important bridging the territorial distinctiveness of regions and uh, of our cultures and languages to bring into a closer collaboration all of the activities and organizations and agencies which are engaged in the pursuit and preservation of the country's heritage and which record and study this heritage. They simply must make better common cause. They have everything to gain by it and nothing to lose by doing so. In fact, it's urgent because I believe we're engaged in a race against time. We need to move more swiftly if we are to preserve for future generations the record, the archives, and the artifacts of our own generation and of the many earlier generations which have preceded us. At present, it is not a race we are winning often. Despite the good work of many people, including many people involved in this conference, every day, invaluable documents and items which embody or convey knowledge of our society and its historical experience are lost through flood or fire or strife or any of the many forms of human negligence, or simply through the wear and tear of the passage of time. He and I first became conscious of this reality six decades ago, and I know you are aware of it every day, but for me it took uh, these two incidents, incidents coming together at a close time to ram the message home. The first involved a then recently retired Chief Justice of Canada with whom I was meeting to discuss some aspects of Canadian studies. We talked of the importance of the documentary legacy and I ventured to ask him with what disposition he had made of his papers, meaning his personal papers. All of his official papers, of course, remained with the court a marvelous old gentleman, and he was astonished that I asked and said the matter had never been raised with him. 
And most of these papers had gone in what he called the cleanup when he retired. Think of the loss. The papers of a Chief Justice of Canada, they were not preserved on the record then. I know that you have remedied this situation in your leadership time. The other happened a matter of a week or two later. Um, I was visiting with the late M.J. Coldwell. You remember the beloved veteran Canadian politician, a founder and leader of the CCF and the Social Democratic Movement in Canada. And I asked him after his papers, and again, he was quite surprised, explaining they had been discarded, as he said, from the attic when they moved from a house to an apartment. There was the, you know, the story of the Regina Manifesto, the founding of the Social Democratic Movement in Canada, gone with, with the papers from the attic. 20, 20 boxes. They're gone, they're gone. Uh, it was these two episodes coming close together which moved me to feel strongly and to write strongly about the need for more attention to our archival heritage. And that is a feeling that I still carry very deeply. Uh, Mr. Chairman, these are just a few of the many challenges faced by archives and those who are responsible for their care. Finding good and right responses to these challenges is a task of truly national importance in a world where knowledge and understanding are so very essential. There is, I think, in particular, a need for further development of our national archival system through linkages and collaborations. There is also scope for more collaboration, as I've suggested, amongst all who are engaged in the preservation, use, and presentation of the components of our national heritage of which archives are at the very heart and core. Thank you.